always got a great story. He's in dream, living in the dream world, and I was like, time to pull up the last image of the talk. And, uh, and James refused to let me use images from his films. This is really interesting. He was like, if you want it, you can. And then trying to find a screen grab of James's films. I got permission like yesterday at the pastor thing. And then we were like desperately trying to find the stills. So finally, this is where we got to today. Chanel is somewhere here who did this. On the computer, if you try to take a screenshot of, uh, on the computer, Apple blacks it out and all this stuff. So I took a picture, a photo, which I just noticed has a cramp painting yeah, from my board in the photo behind. But this is <laughs> which is great. No, it's my <laughs> No, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> but I love this image um, in your film, Lost City of Z. Uh, well, I wanted to kind of wear the, the, the fortune teller. Is a woman. Yeah. Uh, talks to your lead character, right. who's in the war, who's in the front, in the trenches, in the trenches, and kind of tells him you need to be back in that in that jungle, in that right. both the fantasy and, and there's this great moment where the jungle actually. Well, she we shot it twice. We shot it once where she was sitting with him <laughs> in the trenches, and uh, once where we were in the jungle. So you cut back and forth between them. It's, uh, right. I like it. It's been uh, a lot of people have come up to me and told me that they think it's a terrible scene. Why? Right. I have no uh, idea. It was actually a bit natural. It's absurd. The fortune teller in the trenches. I didn't make that up. That was you know I read this story. I based the whole thing on this Robert Gray's memoir called Goodbye to All That that I had read and loved. And, and no, it was it was a fantasy. It's ridiculous. You know that kind of thing. I got a lot of that. Which is fine. I mean, yeah. But it's a, it's, it's a fantastic. I'm glad you like it. I mean, the uh, idea. And then the, 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 the kind of narrative. Well, the idea was that all narrative is, in a sense, a kind of fantasy, right? Right. But we need it. Right. A necessary fantasy. And his necessary fantasy was that jungle. Right. And it's allowed him to survive through terrible circumstances. So that's what that was about, anyway. Does anyone want to ask a question or anything? Do we need to be involved with that? No, 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 no. They have no questions. All of life's questions. Oh, I knew, All right. I knew this guy would. Great. <coughs> I love this guy. I'm doing this talk to you, basically. Yeah. Get everyone else. I'm literally straight at you and Henry and uh, the Georgia. It's like the same, guys. I wondered if you forgot to finish what you were going to say about something. About Lady you mean? About my northern accent? Mm. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'm on the spot. Um, Go for it. I'm wondering if you forgot to finish what you were saying about uh, something that covered so much ground that it's a little bit hard for me to get back to it. Oh, shoot. Um, Does anyone else have a question? <laughs> no, no, that's, that's an awful feeling. I know what you're thinking. Now I'm going, yeah, that was right. I wanted to say something. About coming from Leeds, maybe. Uh, I interrupted you. No, you didn't. I, I, I have a brain that doesn't follow any any straight line at the moment. So it's like unbearable to listen to what's going on. Without James, you guys would be screaming. I'd have to lock the doors. You'd be like, he's, nothing made sense. Um, okay, I got a Yeah, go for it. How much time do we have? I don't know. People can leave it. The doors are unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can relate to what you're saying a whole lot. How do you think the movie Vice, about the vice president, and the Washington insiders manifesting in our president getting away with so much now because they've been getting away with, for example, not he, he never gave his financial information when he was vice president because he didn't have to, I guess. I, I, I'm going to, I'm seeing vice, but I'm going to throw you a quick thing. I, I believe that as a society, uh, the stuff we're accepting from Trump um, is to do with the lack of creativity in our lives. Mm. I'm going to go that, I'm going to go that maybe weird or that self-evident, which is if people are able to be creative, and play with their own reality, they don't need that guy to do it. And right now, most people need 
him to be acting this stuff out. It's kind of a pleasure. You can, you can feel it. The Americans, in a way, are like, ha, ha, ha. look how fucked up this is. Americans have that weird desire to go from Obama to Trump. And it, it's maddening, right? One minute you go into Europe and it's, there's Obama in power, and you're like, no, amazing country, we're wonderful. You know, yeah, all that McDonald's American nightmare thing you said, look at us, blah, blah. And then we got Trump. It's like, what the fuck? And a lot of people voted for him, right? And continue to think he's doing okay. Stuff like that. That, to me, is a lack of imagination, personally. Which is the moment you can imagine yourself doing crazy stuff, you don't need him to do it anymore. And enacting it on people. That's the problem, right? And because as long as he's doing it, you don't have any of the complexity of it. Which is everyone has like a plot for a movie or a story or an artwork they'd like to make. But when you actually do it, it goes kind of weird and wrong. And you're kind of left with yourself. And that's an amazing moment of both humility and reality. Picasso said that great thing. Copy the masters, make, when you make a mistake, that's you, yeah. right? And no, Americans aren't encouraged to do that. So, they got Trump doing it. So that's why when it's like, he didn't do his tax returns, everyone's like, yeah, but it's kind of fun and weird. There's something like that, right? You know what I mean? There's even something like that in the way people laugh about him. There's some bizarre dance we're in with him, where anything could happen, which is scary, which has happened before. Right? And, with, with and so you, I believe it's a lack of creativity. And with you, Thomas, it's the only way we can get from Renaissance nude to Trump's tax returns, right? Yeah. yeah. But I also have to say I like the way you work the Renaissance nude into James's film by showing Trump in the background there. That's, yeah. That's why. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's an accident. <laughs> but, well, there you go. That's the mistake that's, that's you. Right? So, mm -hmm. um, are, there, are there questions? Yeah. Um, you up. It's not as easy for, well, I, I, here's the thing, it's not that easy for me to answer that because I have no objectivity about what it is I'm doing. So you will say things to me about certain painters and I'll be like, what? But then it's very clear that that's the case. So I was obsessed with painting. You still are. Yeah, I'm very bad at it. I'm mean, actually, no, that's not true. I'm technically excellent. If you say to me, you know, I drew, I can draw a picture of my son or daughter or whatever, it's exactly right, but I'm bad, I'm not good, because it's like the kind of, I'd be very good if I were in Central Park drawing portraits for, you know, that would be very, I have that talent, but that's not really what it is, that's not good stuff. So I abandoned it, really, being a painter, because I wasn't very good, and uh, began to see the movies as a kind of way that a fraudulent bad painter can somehow try to be an artist. I mean, I'm being a little bit, but I do try to include, certainly, I try to, I, I have lots of art books, and I'm always, before I make a film, always going through them and trying to jog my memory about painters, and uh, you seem to think it's all about Edward Hopper with me, which... Uh, no, I, 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 you talk a lot about Edward Hopper, and, and um, you talk a lot about, you have a, um, for you it's pretty seamless, painting and, and film. It, it, is, seems, it is that true. You, that you is talk true. pretty comfortably about the two mediums. That's um, true. Never claiming like painting is, you know, defunct and film. No, you're, you're comfortable with it. Yeah, I, I will say that the Edward Hopper thing is, because, is that's because the first show that I ever went to, really, was, uh, it was a one-two punch. I remember there was a retrospective of Picasso at the MoMA. This was in 1979. And then right after that was a retrospective of Hopper at the Whitney. And it was called Edward Hopper, The Art and the Artist. And this gets to your imperfection thing, because I remember looking at his painting early Sunday morning, which had that, you know, it's the one with the barber pole and the things. Anyway, the barber pole was slightly crooked. And I hated that. Like it bought you one. It really to bothered me that the painting had this crooked. <coughs> And my brother knew I loved this painting, and he would make fun of me for it. Hey, what up, kid? You can paint the straight blood before. <laughs> Which is really a ridiculous tease, but that was a tease. 
And I'm thinking about it now. He must have known he was doing it on purpose. He must have done it on purpose. Anyway, I thought that if I touched early Sunday morning, that Edward Hopper's talent would somehow come into me. I was 10 years old or 11. So I went up to early Sunday morning in the Whitney Museum of American Art, and I put my hand all over the painting. This did you not go over well. <laughs> my parents were absolutely beside me. I remember, what are you doing? Oh my God, we raised a child who would touch a painting in a museum. I would want it to be too. And uh, I have to say, it stuck with me. And I became sort of obsessed. So painting is a big deal for me. I still love it. But I don't paint anymore, so maybe I'm full of it. No, I don't think I, don't, I used to love doing that even. But I, like I said, it's probably I paint because I'm not. I'm, I'm only technically good, which doesn't really matter. The, the painter Francis Baker has a great interview with Melvin Bradley. He's pretty good. Can I get drunker and drunker and drunker? You, if anyone's not seen it, it's one of the great interviews with an eyes. And it's one of the great dra dramatizations of the craziness, the true inability of an artist to like fit into to discussion. Now, at one moment, he's saying, if I was an artist now, if I was coming through, I'd be a filmmaker. I don't know why anyone would paint. And um, I love that, that he talked, that he talked like that. He said, you know, I he never dealt with Barbie Weinstein. <laughs> true. 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 But he dealt with Barbara that way. No, that's true. Um, they were equal. Equal, equal. Yeah. Any other, any other? Yeah. Yeah, I had, well, yeah go for well, it. I'm sorry. I was curious about uh, second row, second picture. You started a uh, you started a point on that, and then that you, one, this one, and then you just kind of drifted off. So I, I don't. I would yeah, like yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah, I'm curious. Thanks. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm really glad. Uh, this is a movie, sexy beast. Sexy beast, and and, and I'm going to talk about how film kind of permeated me. Uh, I, I was, you know, I, I, I can't remember when this film came out. Do you remember? Uh, like 2006? 2000, no, no, maybe it's old. Maybe it's 2002? I don't know. I'll find out right now. Right. And there's a moment um, growing up in the, in, the, in the English toxic male violent thing that I grew up in around that for the first time um, I'm not sure if it's a great film, it doesn't really matter to me, but this moment when Ben Kingsley... 2000. 2000. Much older. Um, there's a long story show, if you've never seen the film Sex Abuse, it's really about uh, a criminal who's decided he's retired and there's one last job and, and his old criminal gang come to get him to try to convince him to go back. And really it's about... Uh, something that I really felt leaving the north of England that, and, and I'm still trying to leave the north of England, I'm still currently trying to leave the north of England but at this moment the guy, the, the, the hero has said no I'm not, I'm not doing this paint job right and it's, it's fairly civil still between him and, the, and this guy played by Ben Kingsley which is incredible because he played Gandhi and this guy which is an incredible yeah. thing and this is the most convincing depiction of a certain kind of white British psychopath that I know really well. It's even a little bit in me. There's something about this unrelenting, pointless violence and this lack of space you get from this people. And he, it's the night, and he's talking to himself. There's this scene about how, you know, like, he's basically saying, what, are you going to let him tell you no? Like, how fucking dead, you know? And he's psyching himself up into violence, right? And um, I really, um, that was the first time I'd, I saw a certain kind of maleness dissected like that. Um, and the craziness of it and the insanity of, of, of a violence that I'd lived in, um, and the kind of forces at play in it. And um, that goes back to my point. The film has made excellent villains. Way better than art, in some ways, for me, right now. Film has, has really gotten a dark side of, of, of humans really accurately sometimes. 
Even, I, I mean, for me, a film can be great just because of 